Um, like with everyone, what did you have for breakfast today? Today I had <laughs> I had a croissant with Nutella on it. Oh shit! Um, I was really bad. I slept in and I had to rush out the house. So Nutella big breakfast. Yeah. Oh, I miss that so much. I know it had actually been a while since I'd had Nutella, so <laughs> it felt so good. <laughs> Delish. Welcome to the Uncommon Podcast, and I'm your host, Jordan Mike Lees. We interview unique individuals and investigate interesting topics, helping you to build the uncommon sense crucial to increasing performance. Our guests have included venture capitalists, strength coaches, human rights lawyers, chefs, restaurateurs, and spoken word poets, just to name a few. And we're really inspired by the likes of Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, and Charlie Munger, who I think Charlie in particular has influenced us, always emphasizing that building worldly li- wisdom or that uncommon sense is critical for your growth as an as an individual. If you want to learn more about these previous guests, you can head to neural.com slash podcast, N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E dot com slash podcast. If you like this episode, make sure you leave us a review. It's really important for us to grow our community and those reviews are crucial to that. In return, you can win a few prizes that we've had for our launch competition, including an Apple Watch 2, my favorite, the Kindle Paperwhite, and an Amazon gift card. For further steps, again, head to neural.com slash podcast, where you can also get the show notes for this episode and sign up to have priority access as, as a cognitive insider, as we call it. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. Uh, that's just at Neural, N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E, and the same for Twitter as well. In this episode, we recorded with Flick Mishuro, who is a human rights advocate with a special interest in women's development. In this click first, think last world, I felt that it's important to investigate and understand how to build principles around topics of morality and ethics. This is crucial to identifying the difference between what is right and and what is wrong. And I think the truth to certain topics is incredibly important in this modern era, particularly as globalism and technology affects our political and social landscape, giving rise to trends such as populism, i.e. Trump. We covered a few different topics, including immigration and re- refugee law in Australia, and how Flick would go about convincing those who are anti-immigrant or refugees. Her general guiding principles around these topics um, her specialty areas or, or areas of interest such as income inequality uh, and feminism. We went through morning rituals as well as um, the beauty, I guess, of mindfulness and meditation. So without any further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Flick Mashuro. So Flick, thanks for joining me today. Um, with all guests, to start off, yeah. I'd like to hear a little bit, or maybe I guess like to hear a little bit, little bit about who you are, you know, what you do. I made my own notes about the whole trail of your studies, but maybe just let's let's start from the start. Where were you born? What family do you come from? All that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me on the show. This is pretty cool. Um, and so my introduction to myself, I guess, would be. I'm originally from Zimbabwe, born yeah. there, um, but I've lived here for almost 15 years, so I'm becoming more Aussie than I am Zimbabwean, I guess, <laughs> uh, which is a very interesting place to be in. Um, do, you, do you find that you say specific things that are quite Aussie? Yes, yes. Um, my Australian accent has gotten much stronger. Yeah. Gets stronger when I'm angry, <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> um, and... Yeah, it's interesting because yeah, some people sometimes people ask me like when I'm in Australia, people ask me where are you from, and my first instinct is Zimbabwe. But when I'm traveling and people ask me where I'm from, I say Australia. That's 
yeah, to, <laughs> we can delve into that more. But, um, so yeah, that's my background. Um, I come from a family of three kids. My parents, um, migrated here. My mum came on a work visa. So okay. she was exploring new career options. She was an accountant. Okay. So that's how we ended up in Australia. There was some, uh, opportunities here. Um, and we've, yeah, we've lived in Sydney. We've lived in Brisbane and now we're in Melbourne. Um, here in Melbourne with my husband and I'm currently studying. Okay. Yeah. And so your, your background or, um, I was actually looking <laughs> at LinkedIn. <laughs> sorry, Andy. Um, so like yep. the, You've done Bachelor of Business, Law, yes. International Relations and Affairs. Um, and now, what, what are you studying now? Now I'm doing my Master of Law. So I'm doing okay. the General Masters at University of Melbourne. Oh, cool. But my focus will be on women and development and human rights. Right. So yeah. like essentially human rights lawyer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, does that, do, you, do you end up doing like a major in that area or is it just like you sp- – Select specific you just units. select specific units. Um, that's the great thing about Melbourne Uni's uh, master's course. Mm. It's all by coursework and you just pick whatever units interest you. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking like because you're, you're doing master's. My brother's just started doing his master's of, um, oh, yeah. of math there. And it's really intriguing. The Melbourne model is strange. It's like your undergrad. It's really not specified. You've got to do lots of um, like different – Units from different areas. Like yeah. if you're doing science, you've got to do arts, computer science. Oh, wow. And then, um, what are the other schools there? Like school of engineering. Like, oh, wow. it's quite intriguing. But, um, yeah. And then even the masters, it's, it's still, I, yeah, I think, I don't know if you come out with a major or de- maybe it depends on the school. But. Yeah. I think it depends on the school. Cause I know some of my, um, classmates who are doing, say, a, actually a master in human rights law. Right. Um, so that means they're only open to human rights law units. So I didn't want to sort of limit myself in that regard because, um, cause as you know, I've worked in refugee law for about, I'd say four years altogether, really. Right. Um, since about third, third year at uni. So I, it was an interesting experience and I got sick of it. So I wanted a change. So I'm sort of in a, a place where I'm trying to figure out what I really want to do, but at the moment my heart's leaning towards women and development. Yeah. What well, What was it about it that frustrated you? Um, refugee law. Uh, I guess working onshore because I worked onshore for about two years, and then I started working at the regional processing centres for about two years, and so that that was in the second half. Um, the last two years. I quit last May. I was actually working at the Manus Island Detention Centre. And so, yeah, it was just mentally draining. Um, And just, I think I felt that I wasn't in a position where I I was helping my clients um, and just got a bit heavy. So, Do you find that a lot of people get burnt out? Oh, yes, definitely. It's, um, I think you... Initially, when you get into the work, because it, I guess the, the field draws a certain kind of person. Like it, I feel like everybody who's in the field is a really caring person and wants to help. Mm. You know, you've got this, I guess, this value behind you that you really want to help humanity, you know, make it better. And so you come in, your heart's on your sleeve and yeah. it's just too many feels, you know, if I put it in like meme terms, yeah. too many feels because, um, yeah, a lot of people, because you're working long hours, you're dealing with people who are traumatized and being re-traumatized and then also hearing their stories in a way traumatizes you, you know, because you have to take it on now and be their representative. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, because that was I, – I did notice that just watching – you know, when it, when any guest comes on, I like to go into specific topics on YouTube and the oh, blogosphere yeah. and whatever. And you can just sort of see that it's it's not that it's fruitless. It just sort of seems, um, you know, you go in, you're idealistic, but the realities of the fact that nation states really determine what happens yeah. sort of impacts you a lot. Yeah, I, I've, that's what I got from other people watching their their documentaries and so on. Yes, definitely. You, I think as an individual, you feel, you can, you can start to feel quite helpless when you realize that 
The problem is it's a more it's a more systematic issue, which is much yeah. bigger than you are. And so, you know, I guess you have to decide whether you're you're going to fight this through and become like you know a Martin Luther King or something yeah. like that, yeah. or if you you know if you have the fight in you to actually continue, or if you don't, then you try and help in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this has always intrigued me, and uh, maybe this will give us the opportunity to talk about it now. But how how would one, you know, I wonder what's spoken about in the area of immigration law. Obviously, you would have kept on top of it over the years. How how do people speak about a way of, like, I think about tech and how the tech industry in Silicon Valley is always looking at a specific industry and how they can just blow it up and transform the business model in a way that like I just think about companies like Uber and all that which come into an industry and just destroy it and and change it completely how would one is there a way of doing that in in your mind have you ever theorized about you know I'm sure you've dreamt or like (laughs) come up with like you know you stand there in the shower and you're just thinking about it how what would I do like have you Mm. ever had any aha moments or is it really that you just go it's it's really determined by um you know the UN system and how the nation states work within that um it's interesting because i just did a unit on international refugee law at the masters level and that was amazing we had this lecturer she's passionate about the the area and during that as a class, we actually got a little bit cynical and even the lecturer was laughing about that. She's like, I know it sounds like all doom and gloom. Um, and we're like, yes, it does. <laughs> what, it how do we get past this? Like what's, and really everybody's trying to figure out what we can do mm. because when you're dealing with national interests, it's so hard to, I guess, to actually take on something as a as a citizen as a private citizen and then do something about it so it's you'll i guess when you try to think of solutions you're still trying to figure something out within that framework of the un system of of your local say for us australian legal system as well so i think the what's good i guess about say an industry like the tech industry is that you have market forces playing and everybody assumes that, you know, the free market is good, competition is good, and it's encouraged for people who are not in um, political positions to act. Mm. But actually what I'll say is, <clears throat> excuse me, what I'll say is I think issues of human rights are very political. Yeah. Unlike what? business that's seen to exist in its own sphere. Personally, I think that can be a bit political too, but... Um, not, not as much. Not as much. Why Why is that? I've, I've always been intrigued. How does the... And maybe this will get to our point down the track when we talk mm. about facts and values because I mm. think um, that's important. But, like, why... It, it always mystifies me how this topic gets so politicised. I think it's because it plays on issues of sovereignty and yeah. and I think that's one of the biggest issues with the UN system is that it's based on nation states coming together who claim they want to help the world and help each other, right? Um, but they also want to protect their national interests and mm-hmm. national interests are what their citizens want. Yeah. Um, supposedly. So if, if someone like Michael Turnbull is telling us that it's in our interest to have stringent security measures on who comes here and how they come here, people will look at it as, um, a political issue mm-hmm. because, you know, whether it's, it's left wing to want to open your doors to refugees or it's right wing to want to be conservative. Mm-hmm. So in terms of um, migration policies. So I think that's sort of where human rights end up falling because they're determined by nation states yeah. and nation states are made up of politicians yeah. and they try to represent their people. Yeah. It's, it's intriguing because mm. so one of these blogs that I really do enjoy and it's totally unrelated to politics is yeah. um, it's called Stratacherry and this guy used to work at Apple or something but he talks about um, 
just things in the sphere of the globe. And, and one of them was, I can't remember what the reference was to the, I think it was just the future of work. Okay. And this topic of sovereignty comes up and it talks about what, what is the, the, the government there to do? And at the old model of the, the last, I don't know, 60 to 70 years is you protect the workforce mm-hmm. and you protect the, the people. So security, um, safety of work and I think money was the other thing. Of course. <laughs> of course. And what he, what he's sort of showing is that because of, um, globalization and the, the change in work, how easy it is to get work now in this digital age, that relationship is totally changing because of the so-called gig economy. Mm-hmm. And it sort of seems like, you know, in the last 20 years, let's say, as technologies become more prevalent, mm-hmm. these topics have become more prevalent as well. Um, purely because, uh, I mean, we can see it with Brexit, with Trump and so on, that mm-hmm. um, people are, with globalism, it sort of seems that the world, it sort of seems like nation states, can't, I don't know how much longer they can exist. Mm-hmm. That's sort of my, I don't know what you think about that, but it sort of seems we're, we're getting to a point where technology, work, freedom of movement is so prevalent that what's the point? Exactly. And it's only going to get harder. More. Exactly. So I think. And then that's why you get those rejections of and when you get to populism, because the old infrastructure set up to support the old system doesn't meet what's actually happening in the market and the, the forces in the world. That's it. Hence Brexit and, and Trump. Yeah, exactly. And I think even for a long time, I think people lived without the nation state. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, Say How if you, you think about, well, if you think about prior to not even before colonization in the 1800s, maybe even, I suppose, even much longer than that. Yeah. What I'll say is, what I mean to say is that people lived in smaller groups. Yeah. People didn't look to the nation state. Yeah. And so, for example, in a place like, say, Southeast Asia or Africa, the idea of these borders is is still something that people are learning to live with, but it's it's not effective. Yeah. With the movement of people. And think of, say, for example, people who are nomads, you know, and that's becoming a thing for basically everyone now with this freedom of movement. So Yeah. Yeah, I understand what you mean that nation states before they were redundant and they were created as empires grew. Yeah. But now they're gonna become obsolete again. Yeah. Yeah. It's very yeah, it's it's quite an intriguing time to be alive, you'd say. <laughs> yes, definitely. It's exciting, but it's like a little bit scary and I've I've become so cynical in the last two weeks. I'm just <laughs> yeah. I can't help it. You, uh, but, and we we both read this book, um uh Sapiens. Yes, yes. Did we you did. find that that well maybe well, how how would you surmise that book? <laughs> <laughs> it changed my life. Did it? Yes. How so? Um, I think it's just, pardon the, the use of the phrase, but it's like a black mirror to humanity mm. and we've both seen black mirror. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so just reading that, it kind of, it conceptualized some of the feelings that I was having that I hadn't managed to actually, you know, put into, into words. Right. And I f- I feel like he really, he really captured humanity really well. Yeah. So, so our flaws and the good things about us as well. But he kind of, it's a bit, it's a bit dark. It it's is a bit a, grim. It is a bit. But, um. Well, what I think, yeah, what, what you're saying is really important because it sort of shows humanity as like a species. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, this is what the humans do well. Yes. This is what they don't do well. This is what's hope- happened over their time. Mm-hmm. This is the, you know, because he uses a lot of science to show, like, um, you know, how how things are factually correct or not. And yes. just sort of shows the hypocrisy in so many things that have been done over the last. Yeah, exactly. Thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And even um, in thinking about some of the things that we've done, you see that history repeats itself just in different ways. Mm. We may have all this technology now, but humans will always be humans. You know, they will, 
our values or our, I suppose, our, our love for security, it can be pursued in different ways, but they're not always good ways. Yeah. You know, I mean, take, for example, what's happening in Syria at the moment. Yeah. Like, that's heavy. Mm. And you think with, with how far we've come in trying to create a peaceful world, yet here we are. And it all goes back to those <laughs> stories, as you said. Mm. Your ability to believe a certain um, yes. narrative when it isn't, um, you know, factually correct. Exactly. It's just so intriguing. Um, I mean, going back to the, mm. the immigration thing, mm. how, I mean, first of all, what got you so intrigued in this area? Why, why did you get, what was the moment where you went, all right, this, I want to <laughs> focus on this. And then you spent four years doing it. I actually kind of fell into it. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> like everything. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like everything sometimes. Um, I mean, I was doing my, um, my undergrad, um, at QUT in, Br- in Brisbane and I was trying to figure out what I was doing. Um, because I'll tell you something. I actually wanted to study film. Really? Yes. I wanted to study film. I wanted to be a film director. So I'm, I'm starting that now. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> I was going to make a little like note it. here. Uh, <laughs> sure. Favorite documentaries to watch. Slash yes, film. definitely. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, that was my thing when I finished high school and having migrant parents that said, we didn't come to this country so you could study film. Jesus. <laughs> um, yeah, which kind of sucked. Um, and so my mom wanted me to do business and my dad wanted me to do law. Okay. Like, okay, fine. I'm going to do both. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so that's how I ended up doing the degree that I wanted, um, that I did. And so, um, I'm doing my undergrad studies. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the business side, hating the law. Yeah. So I'm like, uh, property law, constitutional, this is not me. And then someone suggested that I do some of the international law subjects and I loved them mm. because Um, as my mum had pointed out, she said, you love helping people. So I think this will be, you know, a good path for you. I was like, okay, (laughs) mum. And so, yeah. And I just, I, I loved international law. It just really intrigued me. This idea, like it's such a, it's a nice ideal. It is, isn't it? Yeah. The lofty ambitions you put in. Exactly. And I was young and hopeful and I got myself an internship at a refugee law firm. So that's when I, um, that was my first um, interaction with refugee and migration law at that time. And my mentor, he was amazing and he just, he was really passionate about the area as well. So he, I think he taught me really well. Um, he was a great mentor. So yeah, so I got into that and I just kept pursuing it. Um, I just realized that um, I think refugees were sort of like an invisible population at the time that would have been in in 2012 you know without the refugee crisis as we have it now even though there was a crisis back then but (laughs) (laughs) but um yeah so it wasn't as big a deal as it is now but um and i realized that you know this is a really vulnerable group of people and i just wanted to do all i could to help them yeah yeah Yeah. it's it's so intriguing to me how like we were saying before, how this sort of gets politicized. I mean, mm. if you think about, so maybe I don't know how much knowledge you have in this of of the differences between the numbers in skilled migration versus uh, maybe like to speak tell people about what is the difference between a refugee refugee and a migrant? Okay, so like someone who's put on manus, yes, versus someone who just comes here. Okay. Um, so Australia's migration policy is pretty stringent. Mm-hmm. Um, as they have said, they don't like people coming here. Um, and so usually in any given period, they'll have skills that are in need. And so people can come through that route. So they'll get a job and then the employer will sponsor them to come here. Yeah. So I guess those are the legitimate ways. As, <laughs> and I'm using air quotes for the listeners. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, people will come um, that way. And then there's obviously other visas like partner visas and all that sort of stuff, um, holiday and and working holidays and yeah. stuff like that. And then we have the um, refugee um, visa category. Now that's split into two. Okay. There's the onshore visa and the offshore. So the 
offshore, I'll start with, is the one where basically somebody, for example, in a camp in Somalia or Thailand will go to the UNHCR um, office there and they get assessed as a refugee there and then they will be invited, air quotes, by Australia to come. Okay. So UNHCR has done the processing uh, of refugee claims. The, the vetting, yeah. Yeah. And then they just come here and they do health checks and security checks. Yeah. So that's one program but, that we where, have. Where, are the, where is that done? Oh, so that's done in, say, the camp in Thailand. Oh, so or the local the, camp. Yeah. yeah. So somebody might f- be fleeing from wherever and they're in a refugee camp overseas. So this is the offshore program. Okay. And, um, and then we have the onshore program, which is people that arrive here and then apply once they get into Australia. Right. Yeah. And so there's, because there's, I don't even know how politicians came up with this. They're very creative, but, um, they've created this mindset that the offshore process, the one where you apply wherever you are and then UNHCR recommends you is the right way. Right. They've created that that belief. Yeah. But that's actually incorrect. Right. So under international law, um, a person has a right to seek refuge. So they can just- You can show um, up by boat. Yeah. It's- And just claim- It's legal. Yeah. Yeah. Status as a refugee. Exactly. Yeah. And so- And a good example actually may mm. be Julian Assange. Mm-hmm. Technically, he's a refugee. Yes. He's a political refugee. He is, yeah. So so the way it should be done is they should they could come here and then claim- and then that status is assessed, right? Yeah. And depending on that, they would be uh, approved or sent back most likely. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Because one of the requirements of being a refugee is that you have to be outside of your country of residence or outside oh. of your country of citizenship. Okay. Yeah. So you actually can't claim refugee status if you're still in the country that's persecuting you. Right. And so the people that are coming by boat yeah. are... They're, they're technically refugees. They're just yes. the means of their transport is boat because they can't afford to, or the situation has meant that they've yeah. come down that way. Yeah. So it could be a v- number of reasons, but a lot of the times is that, um, people don't have money to, uh, apply for, um, visas while they're still in their home country. Mm. And if you're still in your home country, obviously you're not a refugee. So it's not an option. Yeah. So you have to leave your country and then claim refugee status. So some people will, will flee, say we had a lot of clients from like Sudan and Somalia and they'd come through Thailand and Indonesia and then they get on a boat and get to Australia. So people will say, Oh, why didn't you just uh, get refugee status in Thailand? But you have to, one of the requirements of the refugee convention is that the place where you're seeking refuge status has to actually be able to protect you. And so uh, Australia is a signatory to the Refugee Convention yeah. and the protocol, but Thailand and Indonesia are not. So uh. there's no point of someone trying to seek refuge in those countries because they'll be arrested oh, really? and sent back. Uh, so, so that's half the – because uh, most of the migrants now from it seem that they're from the Middle East. Is that wrong? I'm assuming that. Um, no. Uh, Australia's intake, uh, if I remember correctly, um, some of the biggest numbers were coming from Afghanistan. Okay. Um, and Iraq? Yes, Afghanistan, yeah. Iraq, and, um, and then Sudan and Somalia, and then just going down the list like that. Yeah. So, and yeah. so basically the problem is that, um, they can't afford to get here, uh, via plane or, yeah apply they they haven't found a way to apply in a camp in their country and mm-hmm. then the channel to australia mm-hmm. um is so that the countries along the way make it very hard for them to do it in in a means that would be legal yeah because they'd yeah. be arrested exactly so uh because um like i said those countries if they're not if they haven't signed on to the refugee convention they have no obligation to protect right so australia has an obligation to protect because we've signed the signature um the convention and so when somebody comes here by boat they legally are actually a refugee okay. and then you get assessed and then if if that's confirmed, you get to stay, and you yeah. know, owed further protection. But if, if you're found not to be a refugee, then you just get sent back. Okay. So that's how it's supposed to work. 
Why, why do you think, <coughs> speaking to the people, you've obviously spoken to them directly, why, what's their sense of why they want to come to Australia? Is it it's just not, sheer opportunity? It's not that they want to come to Australia. I think the focus is more on that they want to leave their yeah, home yeah. country. Yeah. Um, because a lot of these people, if you listen to some of their stories, they're being part, they're being victims of ethnic cleansing. Yeah. Um, sexual Sectarian. discrimination or something like that, and the authorities can't protect them. Yeah. So they just try to go to as, wherever they can. Mm. So some people will, yeah, take the route to Europe. Some people will. So, yeah, like when you think of in terms of numbers, presently in the world there are um, 16 million refugees. Oh, wow. There's a lot. Yeah. And um, the biggest – Intake is in Turkey and Lebanon. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, they've got heaps, and that's been increased due to the Syria civil war as well. Yeah. And Australia, I think, took just a couple of thousand. Yeah. So here couple we are thousand? complaining. I, th- I thought it was like 40. four, four. No, no, no. It's yeah. less than um, because I think, especially with the with the onshore, like people who arrive onshore, it's less than ten thousand. Oh wow. Yeah. And then we have spaces with the offshore program as well, which I'm not too sure how many those are. What would be intriguing to see is what that is like per capita. I wonder what it is. Who's taken the most per capita? Uh, America. Really? Yeah. Because they only take like 60,000. Oh, you mean per capita? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm getting confused. Yeah. But um, America is one of the largest refugee intakes. But yeah, yeah not per capita. You're right. Population. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, you're right. Not per capita. So, um, God. Yeah. So. <laughs> So, so oh yeah, I, let me go and explain um, how somebody would end up in Manus or Nauru. Yeah. So these people have come by boat, and Australia has said um, very cleverly. There's some legal stuff. I can get into it if you want, but um, basically, what they decided was if somebody arrives to a place like Christmas Island, it's legally not part of Australian territory for refugee for migrant purposes right it's a very clever way to it's very loyally thing to do it's like yeah this is not part of australia in t- for migration purposes so these people landed there and therefore they're not owed refugee protection or refugee rights i guess so that that meant they could put them in detention centers so what happened basically they it was a very arbitrary process and really i think somebody should look into this um because what they did was they just decided they just picked some random dates. People from who came by boat between these days and these days will be sent to um, offshore processing centers. But the interesting thing was not everybody who came between those days was sent to offshore processing centers. Right. So it would have been it was a it would have been a random selection because I had clients who because they yeah because if they did it any other way then um, they'd be in, under even more heat. Yeah, you'd have to do it at random yeah, if you were had, going to do it. Yeah, and I, I, I had trouble understanding how, how they picked the randomness of it because, because they, when you come by boat, you're given a boat ID and okay. they're in consecutive numbers, and so I'd meet with clients and I'd look at the database of clients in the system, and you'd see that there's just like maybe from blah 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 seventy, seventy two to seventy six is not on island. They're still in Australia, but do right. you know what I mean? So it's very arbitrary. Don't know how they, they decided. They, they don't tell that. you or? No, no. Okay. And I don't think I'd dare ask. Right. I'd be too scared. <laughs> so, um, yeah. The, it, and w- what's intriguing about all this to me is how it gets spun up politically because, like, mm. the assumption is or what a lot of politicians say is that they they're coming here – what it used to be was like the sort of they took our jabs kind of you know um, memo, memo yeah. going around, but now yeah. it's more security. And it, I, I find mm. it intriguing because I mean, you work in finance, like most of the people there are on uh, what are the what's the skilled visa called? Ah, uh, yeah. Before you get PR, um, uh, I don't remember the number. It's four four five seven. Yeah, four five yeah. seven actually. Yeah, like yeah, I, yeah. I worked at a company that had. Just trying to think. One, two, three, four, five. So there's maybe sixteen to seventeen staff. Five of us were Australian. Mm. Maybe six were British. 
Yeah. Maybe four were uh, Indian mm. and what does that leave me with? A few more who were Chinese. Okay. And they're all here and they were all sponsored. Mm. Um, you go meet with, I mean, and you make, you make friends, you, make, you um, meet their friends. They're all here on 457 visas. But, you know, and so like the, the focus on the certain group, I mean, if people really wanted to get narky about it, they could focus just on the <laughs> British. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're actually, yeah, they're the most here. There were so many at my uni as well. But, but I it's mean. A, that, that though, in saying that, mm. like that has been a good thing because I was looking at a piece by The Guardian and how they, they've sort of not shown, but they've sort of surmised that without the recent influx of immigration, because we've actually done pretty well on skilled migration. Yes. Like we've had the most skilled migration per capita than anywhere else in the world. Mm. Um, second only to, I think, Canada or the US. Yeah. But that has basically, that, that new group of people coming in has almost brought like a new generation. Yeah. And um, a, a generation of people who have m- therefore money to spend in the economy, which has stopped, yeah, uh, you know, the property boom shitting itself, um, exactly. the country just dying off in terms of um, economics. So yeah, I think people that have that mentality obviously don't have an understanding of economics um, because um, a, if you look at the fact that when migrants come here, they contribute to the economy a lot. Aside from the fact that they pay taxes, but they're mm. not owed social services. That's just one way. Yeah. But also in terms of looking at the fact that some of the reason, the reason why some of these skilled migrants come here is because there's a, there's a gap in the job market. Yeah. So they these, can't get work at home and they, they, they can't get, they come here. No, no, no. Not just that, but even in the Australian market. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. because there's, there's a, not enough skills. Exactly. There's not enough skills. Yeah. We're, we're a small country. Our population is very, very small. And so, and we're growing. Mm. And so I think people who use that phrase, taking our jobs, it's, it's like, well, those are the jobs that you guys aren't doing. So yeah. the government feels a need to invite outsiders to come and do these jobs. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's intriguing because I, I mean, I come from a Greek family. My grandfather came here. He was either here or Argentina. Thank God he came here because I wouldn't be alive. Because <laughs> um, my mother's side is um, multi generation Australian. But mm. um, yeah, it was just like okay, this is where this is where the work is. Mm. Um, I I wonder how it differed back then. You know, I wonder if they had skilled visas or they were just it was after was the war, the- so they were just like, come, mm. we need men because yeah. you know you got to think World War Two, shitload of men dead. Exactly. Um, yeah, I remember my grandma because she's, um, I guess she's Australian, but really an English family. But she just said that all the men were gone, wow, basically. I can imagine in that. that era. So they had to get men. Yeah. <laughs> so at that, at that age, it was of course um, Mediterranean men, so Greeks, Italians. Yeah. Um, not so much Spanish, but yeah, particularly Greeks and Italians. But yeah, it's intriguing how it changes over each generation. Um, exactly. The, the angst needs. towards. Uh, Migrants and so forth. Yeah. Well, um, Australia has a long history of not liking migrants. So, I mean, let's not forget about yeah, the white-only the Australia white. policy. That amazed me when I learned about it. <laughs> yeah, I was me too. quite shocked. Like, you know, you think there has now – one of the most intriguing things, though, was um, the Chinese popular because it was mainly targeting blacks and Asians. Yeah. Yeah, I remember um, they called it yellow fever or something. Yeah, something or like that. Partic- but I think terrible. it was particularly focused on Asians because of the the gold, the gold rush, mm. um, and then how that had died off in the eighteen eighties, and there was a whole bunch of Chinese and like, oh, they took our jabs. <laughs> but like, what's intriguing is looking at folk because I went years ago because I'm pretty sure my grandfather was in the immigration museum at oh, down yeah. on Lonsdale. I don't know if they've moved not Lonsdale. Um, industry i don't know if they've moved it yeah but um yeah we went down there and had a look and um it's intriguing like there was families that had only married between other chinese families and so a chinese oh, okay. family had gone on for now multiple generations in australia until the white australia policy and end- ended in like the 70s oh, my goodness. it's intriguing and now like you see like australia has is really now becoming really is a Eurasian country. Yeah, yeah. There's is. absolutely no doubt. Yeah, we, we don't want to say it, but we're part of the Pacific. <laughs> we pretty much, well, yeah, geographically <laughs> we are. are. It's, it's funny because the, the, the founder of the company that um, 
myself and Tender work out, um, mm. talks about how ridiculous it is that we don't just like totally pivot towards Asia. Like short term, there'll be a bit of pain. And yes, we've got, you know, we're essentially like one of the states of America in some ways, yeah. um, socially and, and politically. But, um, yeah, to, to pivot to Asia would be such a smart thing. It really would be. And even when I think in terms of migration, um, I think Australia would have to be played smart because especially in terms of dealing with the refugee problem, um, that's one thing that we talk about. Um, I just referring to your question about solutions before yeah. having a regional solution, you know, actually working with our neighbors to say, how do we combat uh, this? Cause I mean, yeah. Europe's done that. You okay. Know? Well, Just, what's, what's the European? Cause I know that there's a split on how many refugees that they, they take. And- I'm not too sure. Actually, I haven't read up on the latest thing, but with Europe, it's good because they've got the human rights. They actually have a human rights convention, mm-hmm. like the European human rights convention and every nation state's required to adhere to that. So, um, so far in terms of dealing with refugee issues and human rights issues, it's, it's been uniform across to an extent anyway, uniform across the, um, the continent. Mm. So I think Australia, if it tried to have something, and I, and Africa has, something similar as well they have Uh their own convention for refugees and they're trying to deal with the problem regionally okay yeah and i think australia i think it's sort of kicking itself so there's there's no convention here in the asia pacific no um so that's the thing it's very fascinating especially with migration because um australia is one of the few signatories in this region okay yeah who who are the others I forget now. This was like two weeks ago that I just lent this. But, um, yeah, um, I think Japan and not too sure what the other one is. Yeah, Japan's an inter- co- interesting co- one because you've traveled there as well. Yeah. And there is <laughs> – I don't see many <laughs> refugees there at all. No, they probably have a really strict – but, yeah, they're a signatory. So, right. But, yeah, all the countries that, that have some of the biggest refugee – that are the biggest refugee producing and taking countries are not signatory. So places like Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, I mean, they have their own frameworks locally, but obviously they're not implemented. And so yeah. it's quite ineffective. So for the person who I guess is going, well, who, ca- what do I care? Like why, mm. why would I care about refugees and so forth? And this probably goes to the topic of, building like principles around how would I phrase it? I'm just trying to think of like social, political topics. How can you build principles that sort of guide whether something is right or wrong? And the example that I was, we, mm. we talk, spoke about a couple of times was how, um, and I, you know, we both like Sam Harris in different ways, how, how he's spoken about um, facts versus values. Mm. So like facts, He's trying to. He's try. I think what he's trying to do is use the scientific mm. method for uh, social issues. Mm, yeah, if that makes sense. Yes. So, like, trying to look at factually what is happening here. Is this uh, right or wrong? How can I surmise a position on this and then take it forward? Yeah. So, for, for the person who's thinking about um, refugees, how, why is it the right thing to do? Do you think? It's <laughs> <laughs> a big question. Yeah. Um, I think in a way I agree with Sam Harris about um, about facts. Um, but the only th- trouble with that is mm. is that it maintains the current system. Mm. So sometimes you might <clears> – <throat> so if you look at a situation and just be like, okay, is this right or wrong? Um Obviously, say, for example, Donald Trump trying to put a travel ban, something like that. Okay. Is it, how do you, how do you then define whether it's right or wrong? Because right or wrong in whose eyes? So in terms of America, they're trying to protect themselves against terrorism. So it's the right thing to do. Yeah. But, (laughs) but then, then you got, for me, I think about humanity as a whole and what kind of precedent that might set Hmm. when we, discriminate against a population based on a narrow view of them that we have or have at times even created. Mm. Yeah, I think um I think he's overriding 
goal is to look at things like like um, Yuval Noah Harari, the Sapiens guy. Yeah, uh, looking at things from a global perspective. Mm. I think it's so obvious that that Trump ban or the that ban was ridiculous because if yes. you wanted to really prevent, I mean, the obvious one to me is just ban uh, ban travel to and from Saudi Arabia because that's where yeah. most of the issues stem from in that region. Mm. Um, it, it was ridiculous, like, and particularly the thing with Iraq. Yeah, exactly. That made no sense yeah, if you're meant it, to be supporting that government. That's right. So, so I guess, yeah, looking at facts might sometimes not necessarily be helpful. Mm. But um, I don't know. For me, what what guides me is thinking about the human cost and what it means for our morality and ethics. Yeah, that's that's the biggest thing for me. That's that's probably the biggest thing. I mean, you. You think about, yeah, here in Australia, we're living pretty comfortably and you have people that, um, you know, are coming here to seek refuge or coming here bec- simply because the country might offer a better life than in their home country. Someone actually said something really fascinating in my class. She was a criminal lawyer and she said, I'd rather a guilty person get off than an innocent person spend the rest of their life in prison. Right. And I thought that was really fascinating because in a way I, I understand people's fears. Like there's people that could abuse the system, mm. but then there's people, the overwhelming majority is actually trying to get help. Yeah. So we should then – act to the benefit of this majority, not just to protect ourselves about this, but from this small group that are trying to hurt everybody else. So the, the drive to help this bigger group should be what frames, frames our, frames our actions. Yeah. I think that reminds me of one of the other notes I had about Mm. empathy versus compassion. Yeah. Because I've heard, I've read that empathy can, make an individual choose um like a, the example was they there was an att- it was a test done in nature and basically mm. they had people from one football team mm-hmm. watch another person from another football team like supporters mm-hmm. and they were watching them through a window and they were being shot they they thought they were being shot and they were like doing a, i think they had just an EEG monitor so like a thing that covers your head and sees um changes in your brain and i think yeah. it in t- the circumstance when they're watching the person that supports their team there was um <laughs> that like the the feeling of fright or like anger like they wanted to help them but then if it was someone from an opposite team it was the feeling of pleasure yeah so this was like a this is like a study done on empathy and um anyway this this guy that was talking about it was just saying that um having compassion which is a hard thing to convince people to do Mm-hmm. It sort of sounds like that's what you're saying. Yeah. Having compassion is, uh, I guess, a way to have compassion for the, <laughs> for the people that are, that are in difficult times. Yeah, that's it. I think that's, I mean, that, that, um, experiment is fascinating. I yeah. think it's very telling of us as human beings. We have, we're, I think, maybe we're just wired that way to have that us and them kind of. And so I think we have to move beyond that. And it kind of gets into that whole realm of, you know, meditation and mindfulness and, um, and compassion. And I think, I don't know, for me, I'd be happier being in that, in that camp. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd be able to sleep at night. (laughs) So going back to, what um sort of defines your principles do you mm. do you have like a certain set of principles that you use when you look at a different social or morality topic um because you said before that your mum said that overall you like helping people so is it is that the overriding thing or is there something else going on there um i don't even know i've never really thought about it um but i suppose if i had to say it would be I have a drive to to be happy. And for me, 
um, I'm happy when everyone is happy as well. Um, kind of gets into the whole altruism debate a little bit. Um, is yeah. it truly altruistic to help people? Was going to help me, do you, but do you, speaking of altruism, <laughs> do you know that guy um, who started the effective altruism movement? No, what's you his ever name? seen? Um, Maybe his oh, name he's might a, ring He's a about. doctor from Oxford. Okay, uh, Will McCaskill. No, no, and no. so this guy. Uh, I think he earns up to oh, it's like 36,000 US a year. So he keeps that for himself to live and then everything above that he donates. Oh, wow. And he also has a website that looks at the most effective uh, non-for-profits. Yeah. Like a good example what he was talking about is how um, if you look at like the the Clinton <clears> – <throat> The Clinton Foundation yeah. was literally just like salaries for the Clintons. Yeah. But then like the foundation that is um, something around malaria is like yes, really Yes, the Malaria effective. Foundation yeah. I've heard about. Um, like dollar for a dollar, the amount of work that they – of that's what it is. The amount of lives that they can save or lives that they can change is unparalleled. Yeah. So. Um, wow. Anyway, you were saying I just <laughs> – I don't remember now. I think I was – yeah, I was just talking about – um oh, yeah, my guiding principles. Yeah, so I think happiness is okay. is definitely key um just in terms of cre- – it's very idealistic, but creating a better world in a sense. Um I really enjoy working with people to kind of aspire to that. Yeah, that yeah. makes total sense. I mean, it just – in this era where there's so much to go around, it seems obscene mm. that in one part of the world people are dying from malaria and then and actually no, malaria and not enough food or yeah. diarrhea. Yeah. And then on the other side of the world you have people dying because yeah. they're too fat. <laughs> exactly. Obesity and diabetes. It's just It's ridiculous. Yeah. So exactly. I can in this modern era just it it makes so much sense that it, it can be possible and it doesn't make sense why you would be opposed to it. Mm. That's that's just my opinion on it, but yeah. yeah. Ha- happiness is a good one. It's funny because tenders <laughs> and that. <laughs> Whatever makes me happy. Yeah, no, that's it. Um, I think, yeah. Uh, okay, where do I start? So much I want to cover. You, okay. you, had, you mentioned to me something that's really coming up in the media a lot now mm. um, about – Technology and or income inequality, or what oh, yes. what is going on there? Uh, yeah, my understanding of that is, um, I've been actually I was in the camp where I was like, I'm not too sure if I want you know this technological ad- advancement to keep going because it'll continue to create further inequalities. Um, but somebody was telling me about the basic income yeah. model. And I thought that was really fascinating and I was a bit resistant to it, but I thought in a world where people don't have to work, like what do we have to live for? Yeah, that, that, that then starts asking the question of what am I here for? Yeah, exactly. But I think because that's what we've done for the <laughs> since we were, you know, yeah. Homo sapiens evolving and with the agricultural revolution, we, we live to work and we work to live. So – my fear initially was that I really feel like it will create a greater divide between the, the rich and the poor. Yeah, there's, and, no, there's no doubt. Mm. Because if you have capital and now now all the capital, there's no need for labor. Exactly. Like I'm actually reading a really – oh, wow, I just finished it. Yeah. It was um, the biography with Andrew Carnegie. So he was like a um, – one of the – like the Elon Musk of the 1800s. Oh, right. Um, so made his money on the railroads and steel. But you can just mm-hmm. sort of see how back then you still had to spend money on both labor and capital as in equipment and people. Mm-hmm. And and now it's sort of, you know, with the prevalence of technology and particularly the use of algorithms now, yes. people are becoming less relevant unless they have an education and understanding – to apply that capital themselves, mm-hmm. they're going to be sort of stuck in a like in an infinite loop of uh, poverty. That's it. So, how then do we create a world where things are equal? In yeah, that sort of. I think what what will eventually what what will happen is 
it was actually so funny because Joe Rogan was talking to this other guy and Sam Harris about this. Yeah. There's no way you can have multiple trillionaires walking on the planet, you know, just living in their compounds no. with their personal army and that society won't destroy itself and reject it. Exactly. Um, you would have massive upheavals to the point where it would be a bloodbath. Do you know what I mean? Can we take a break? Yeah, that's fine. Awesome. Okay, so we're back. I thought uh, Flick had to run over the road to pay <laughs> for a car park. Turns out she can just use the app as we're complaining about technology. <laughs> well, not really. Um, but, yeah, so what were we saying? We're talking about, um, yeah, so if you've got these really, really wealthy people, um, there's, I just don't know how the capitalists – I think I think what, what Yuval said in Sapiens was um, – Capitalism has been really good because it allows – resources is like the most important thing for humans, right? So if we okay. go back thousands of years, the most important resources would be food and heat and shelter. Mm. Um, and now we just have a means of exchange, exchanging that better um, and a system that uh, aggregates that better. If, But because there's only X amount of money in the world, mm. if a whole bunch of people have – like 80% of it, mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's just going to be massive upheaval. Yeah. So I think that people will realize in the next five to ten years, if you're um, – I, I don't know – I mean, who was it? Bill Gates was saying something about taxing robots. I don't – that seems stupid, just tax, tax the company. Tax like, the company that makes it, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that doesn't make sense to me, but um, maybe he's trying to show that if you were – Owning the robots. Oh, yeah, and then um, there'd be a you, tax. Oh, that, I guess that would make sense, I guess. Yeah, it's but, hard because... And then that would be distributed to say something like... Um, like like a fund that becomes the universal basic income. I think I think it'd be good. I mean, you've got to think about it. Like you then get rid of all of your government department. The major components of the social welfare system mm -hmm. doesn't have to be managed anymore. You just pay one lump sum that covers all your Medicare and Everything, all yeah, that sort of stuff. So it wouldn't have to be. So like from an economics point of view, it makes more sense. There's less administration. You can put more people towards improving systems and services. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I think it's going to be, it's going to be a very, very, important area for the next 10 years that's for yeah. sure and i think governments need to really wake up on this one because a lot of the times governments get you know hit in the head with things They're like oh we didn't see that coming sort of thing mm. um but at the moment it's really great because we have we have scientists intellectuals foreshadowing this change yeah. and i think governments really need to pay attention as to how they're going to adapt with that because in a country because the problem is um, a lot of this will end up being concentrated in what we now call the global north. So we, um, in, in our studies, we don't like to use the terms first world, third world developing country. We now use the terms um, global north, which includes countries like Australia, the US. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then the global south, which would be um, Africa, Asia and South America. And so you see, you will see a lot of this wealth being concentrated in the global north mm. and it's being facilitated by labor in the global south. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? So, you know, they'll be using offshore um, factories, which they, they do now, and it's just going to become even more because labor is cheap. Yeah. And so, how will then, um, how will then, the, I guess, the global north help the global south catch up in terms of technology. Yeah. If they are using their resources in that way. Yeah. See, this has been discussed now. Yeah. Um, about like the the saying is for the um for the uh, clothing line worker in Bangladesh. Yeah. They're not going to be right now with their skill set. They're not going to be creating. Um, virtual reality algorithms. No. So um, this isn't just a – yeah, I, I actually, no, it was Yuval. I yeah. <laughs> keep referencing this guy so much. But he's so good for this stuff, you know, yeah. um, as a historian. But 
you're saying universal what is universal basic what is basic you know mm-hmm. like he his question is it can't work unless there is just one global government mm-hmm. and i i i mean this goes back to the whole nation state thing i just don't yeah. think that i just think there's going to be so much political issues for the next 10 to 15 years what well, what will probably trigger it will be when all of the truck drivers are made redundant because autonomous tr- uh, uh, cars, yeah. um, and it'll be trucks first. I guarantee you yeah, that will trucks become autonomous. Are going. Have you ever seen that movie Logan, the, the yes. recent X Men? Do you remember like the trucks? They're all yeah, driving they on their own. They're all driving on their own. I remember That's that. it. And and you know it's what? Happening. All all of that group of workers are, in, particularly in America, are white males, but they're they're actually. Uh, are they older? I think they're a little bit older, but that it's a lot. It's like the it's huge... the most employed position in America, second only to cashiers. Oh wow! Yeah, and cashiers were, even now we're just seeing that cashiers are redundant. going. Yeah, I mean, who who wants to go to the <laughs> cashier? Like, Self check out every time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, I I do think that yeah, the next ten to fifteen years, people can't really hide from this issue because it's no. going to cause a lot of tension, a lot of violence, and. All. Yeah, um, yeah I just can't. I wonder whether we can have a universe that just you know let's say America institutes a universal basic income. What does that de- do for um, refugee movements? Does that all of a sudden overburden them because people are like I need uh, to go here? Yeah, because because I can, can get educated. Like and you know like the best universal basic income systems will be the ones that will attract the most refugees or migrants or whatever. Because like imagine if you could go to a country. Yeah. You can get the income, but you can also get educated, re-educated. Exactly. Like, and then there's, yeah, and then there would be – I see what you mean. Like the nation state will become redundant in that way because yeah. people are now global <clears throat> citizens. And that's – and I read this article recently about um, how we actually create poverty in how we live our lives. And, how, do you, um, how do you mean? And so – it was looking at it from a development perspective. Um, and what the author was saying was that in, in the world today, we have, we have capitalism as, you know, and neoliberalism as, you know, the cornerstone of society. We can't even imagine a world without it, right? And so you as a citizen living in the global north enjoy your, lifestyle um you buy your nikes you buy your h&m goods <laughs> but where are they made they're mm. made in the global in the global south and it's only possible because of the of the say for example the labor laws in those countries you know to get that cheap labor so you as a person working in development you try to you want to maintain this lifestyle that you have in your home country mm. and then you go over here to the global south but you're exploiting inadvertently the very people that you want to help. Mm. So, so even if you think of multi- other multinational organizations like McDonald's or KFC or anything like that, they're an Apple. They're exploiting, you know, the global South to maintain this lifestyle that we have and to further create wealth mm. in, in countries like Australia and the U S and UK but it's based off the backs of people in the global south. So even if you go there to try and do a development program and you're you're still part of creating the poverty because of what your lifestyle is like when you go back home. Yeah. So, yeah, so you just made an interesting distinction there because when mm-hmm. people um when people think about poor, mm-hmm. they don't they they're always thinking about um sort of citizens within their own country they don't uh, yeah. they don't think about you know people in developing countries yeah so that's in that's in that's a good point yeah i thought that was fascinating i mean that's just that person's theory but um i think it's it's fascinating when you think about how liberalism works and mm. how capitalism works um for you to i mean they use this term trickle down economics but yeah it, it like doesn't i mean we we did it in economics classes. Yeah. It doesn't work because yeah. um, the one thing the rich people are very good at is saving money and and yeah. redeploying that money to make more money. Exactly. Um, and unless you're educated and and understand that, then of course you're not going to get rise up 
up the ranks, so to speak. I think George yeah. Carlin used to have a brilliant quote. It's like, yeah. uh, the re- <laughs> um, and you know, don't get me wrong, I come from a, a family that's been quite well off in mm. the last generation. Um, yeah. So, you know, my dad's, is he first generation? Second generation, Second generation I'm, I'm was, third. Yeah, third, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the saying is, he's a comedian, by the way. Yeah. Uh, the rich, <laughs> he's very pessimistic. He was, he died years ago. But the rich own the country, the middle class work for the country, <laughs> the, the poor are there to scare the shit out of the middle class. <laughs> And it's such a harsh quote, but that's what I think comedy does. It sort of mm-hmm. makes you step back and go, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I, I can definitely understand what you're saying. I think that, again, that's going to become another great issue yeah. over the next few years. Yeah, because I think in this field of development, I mean, that's what we're we're trying to do. We're going to to places looking at what the development needs are, you know, to create – uh, to, I guess, bring these communities up to the global standard of what, you know, the good life is. Yeah. And that's defined by the capitalist good life. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, um, I want to – I'm okay. I'm yeah. just checking the time <laughs> now. I'm realizing, like, uh, yeah. wow, I'm running out of time. There's so many okay. things I want to cover. Okay. Um, what what we okay? So the other area that you've covered as well is um, uh, feminism or um, women's rights, so to speak. Um, how did you get into that? Where did that come from? Um, I think I was I was born a feminist. <laughs> it's just <laughs> I come uh, from a long line of matriarchs, so I think it was just in, embedded in me, and I and I've just been feminist in my way of acting without before I actually adopted the label. Yeah. So say for example, my grandmother, she's a senator. Um, for, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, in Zimbabwe for um, the opposition party. Okay. Um, and my mother, she was a very hardworking woman and, um, you know, she raised us by herself, single mother. So I think it's just, um, yes, yeah, so I've just had this appreciation of what women can, can do. I've seen, I've been raised by strong women. And so it just, I've always been really partial to women in in um, positions where they're vulnerable. Yeah. So I think I've I've always been interested in that as well. And so um, I recently, I'd say, starting last year, have been getting into that um, and talking a little bit more about it. And I'm working for the International Women's Development Agency. Okay. Which is um, what was really that? F- so it's a um, it's Australia's leading and only um, organ- uh, NGO that deals specifically with uh, women and human rights and development, and they operate in the Pacific, so countries like Fiji, Solomon Islands, PNG, uh, and Nepal, um, and Bangladesh. Yeah. Okay. And um, so I guess this is something I've, I've spoken with Tend about heaps as well, mm. is um, I just remember like maybe it was – Years ago, maybe it was like two years ago, yeah. and um, I just I mentioned to someone like, "Oh yeah, I'm a I'm a feminist," and um, I just remember the reaction from these two guys. I was like quite surprised. Yeah. Um, but I can sort of I, I don't think I was in tune with um all that stuff. I just didn't pay attention to it at all. Mm. I'm just I, I'm interested to get your opinion on because this is the biggest thing now with um. Uh, this is like that broad ranging area of social justice warriors, which unfortunately gets lumped into feminism. Yeah. Um, I mean, why, why has this whole thing become so divisive? You know, like it, it sort of surprises me a lot. Yeah. Um, where do I start? Cause, uh- <laughs> cause like to, to preface that, like, yeah, I, I, th- as an exa- as a few examples, I think that um, uh, when it comes to feminist issues, I think like a lot of the issues spoken about in uh, I guess the first world or what you're saying, like the the north, uh, sorry the global north, global north, <laughs> yeah, they don't they they sort of pale in comparison to issues in the south and particularly some countries. I I mean I'm particularly focused on Saudi Arabia because I think the yeah. way that they treat women is terrible. Yeah. Um, 
so the, there's that. And then also, um, you know, just I guess the, the way that these guys spoke about it is, um, yeah, the divisiveness of, of man versus yeah. woman. Um, I think it's fascinating for me because when I think of feminism, the feminism that I adhere to is – is about making sure that everyone has yeah. equal economic, political, and civil rights. That's that's the start for me. Um, but I think the right tries to throw around this word, this phrase, identity politics. Yeah. And yeah, it's huge. Yeah, I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what what is it? Can you ex- like for people? Because I don't think a lot of people would have heard about it before. Um, I guess. How can I explain it? Um, identity politics. Hold on, give me a second. Just, um, it's give you a good definition. So, it's basically this idea that there's structures of oppression um, that have created shared experiences and identities for the people who are oppressed, and so these these shared experiences and identities of the group are now used as a formation for the liberation of those groups. So say, for example, with women, you know, we've been targeted because we are women and have been viewed as a weaker sex. And so that identification now becomes the basis of our getting together and right. now fighting for our rights as as a group. And, and then now these groups are working to create positive group identities and fight for rights that, um, you know, belong to the groups already, but haven't been granted yet by yeah. society. Yeah. yeah. So like, um, going back to the, the fe- feminism side, um, mm. yeah, one of the examples that we were chatting about, and, uh, <laughs> this is what annoys me is that it just, um, Sometimes it gets spun into areas of irrelevance. Like I, yeah. I, I couldn't believe that um, uh, Caitlyn Jenner <laughs> I'm <gonna> be, <laughs> um, was awarded Woman of the Year. I just remember hearing yeah. that, and I just thought, this is when this is this gives because um, I, I find that I sort of sit fairly in the middle, so I can see yeah. that that gives ammo for the right side of politics against the left side of politics. Yes. And it, that's, that's, I guess, the thing that I've been able to pick up. And, you know, you go look at either side. I think they've got both, both got interesting positions or, mm-hmm. um, positions that are both wrong and right. But, um, that sort of stuff is hilarious when it happens. Yeah. Um, it, it really is. And I, and I think what, and that's probably what creates the divide, like just yeah. how, how insane it can get. Yeah. Um, and I feel like for a lot of people that don't identify with feminism, um, especially men feel that it excludes men's experiences. Yeah. Um, and I, I definitely, yeah. I think that's the biggest thing that I get from most other guys. Mm. They, and they feel that there's, there's a diff, there's r- different brands of feminism and some brands actually hate men. Yeah. And I think so, ma- I don't agree with them. Um, but they've created this. I guess this image now of yeah. feminism as a whole, and some people that's all they see. They say you're men hating. So, so what are the different it. like groups of? Because I think this is this like the different waves of feminism. Yeah. So there's um, so there's liberal feminism, which is I guess the the beginning, okay. um, and that's sort of that's sort of what started out in the West, and then there's, is this like. Um, uh, when women were petitioning for the right to vote, um, uh, what is it? Uh, suffraging? Yeah, what, the what, suffragette movement. What? What is that? I'm not too sure. Um, I'm, I don't see. That's the thing. I think for me, being being a black woman, um, liberal feminism is actually not something I identify okay. with because it focuses on different issues for women. Okay. Um, and then there's what's the other one? There's cultural feminism um and then there's radical feminism and then there's like the critical critical theory feminism which is the latest one but um because i think the liberal feminist approach 
kind of tried to say all women have the same issues. Um, and I, I would argue that, um, say for example, um, women's issues that white women would deal with would be different to the ones that black women deal with. Right. Um, and so it didn't, it didn't address that sectionality and the own intersectionality and the only, um, and the other thing was it didn't, um, address things like gender identity and also, um, sexual identity and, um, class issues. Right. So it kind of, it was a very blanket statement about all women are, are like this. Yeah. And so cultural feminism kind of came in and tried to change that to look at, um, trying to still look at what unifies us as women. Okay. But I probably, yeah, would adhere to radical femi- feminism just because it, tries to really um, break down the different intersections. So, yeah, what they call intersectionality to say, okay, I'm a black woman. Um, so somebody, their other feminist issue might be that they're lesbian as well or that they're disabled. So it, um, it depends. Yeah, it really depends. So Yeah. Mm. And, um, yeah, I guess that's one of the – looking at the right side, they get pretty upset about all that stuff. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't think we have time to go into it. But, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I think, I, I think like, going back to what you were saying, um, I sort of like the, the way that you've come from. I, lo- I respect people like – I mean, people get a bit upset. I know that Jermaine Greer went a bit nuclear on uh, yeah. the whole Caitlyn Jenner thing. Yeah. And that's where I sort of paid attention. I'm like, okay, mm. so she's saying something, I'll, I'll give it a look. But, um, yeah. yeah, it just seems to me that um, there are issues for each gender. It's just some are more important than others. Yeah. And um, yeah. and I think that's and particularly of, that mm, what you like the first world versus the developing world. That's really important. That's it exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, that I think in the in the West, um, women are more concerned with um, civil and political rights. Yeah. Um. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, civil civil liberties. So you know, can I can I wear this dress without a man looking me up and down or those sort of things. Whereas in the global South, women are like, can I get a job? Can I eat? Can I feed my kids? Yeah. Can I have land rights so I can, yeah. you know, so it's, it's, um, it's a different level. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, you could, you, you could label them first world problems, but it's not to diminish them at all. Yeah, exactly. It's it just still sh- a struggle. Yeah. But it's just to show that some problems are more, I think some important uh, problems need to be addressed first. first yeah. Um, I, I mean, yeah, that whole Saudi Arabia documentary just blew yeah. my mind. What's it called? I need to. Um, I think it's just called Saudi Arabia Exposed. It's definitely okay. on Netflix. Okay. Um, just, oh, just yeah. things like how it just. I just think like if I had a daughter, you know, like, mm. um, God, it just makes me so angry. Like, if a woman is raped, um, unless there are other men there to, to as witnesses. Um, she wasn't technically raped and it's also her fault if it was from another man and that is considered adultery of which you can be killed for. Yeah. It's someone who's not her husband. Exactly. Yeah. Um, things like, uh, that, that in particular blew me away. Like just the, the, the genital mutilation thing is just horrible. I didn't know they did that there. Wow. I, th- uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Um, it's definitely I know in in a few North African countries. Yeah, that that's that's. Hu- yeah. I remember seeing a Vice doco of this young yeah. lady who had immigrated to America, and just it fucks people up. Like yeah. I don't know how you could want to do that to someone, but I guess yeah. that's you know that's yeah, another it, big issue. It does because I think it's it's huge issue because it kind of now brings into play human rights versus culture kind of thing. Yeah. Like, you know, are we just, are we telling them that they're barbaric because they're brown? Like, you know. Yeah. But um, I have my own views on that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, honor killings as well. That yes. was horrendous. Yeah. It's so sad. It's like, yeah. um, oh, what was the example that I, I just hear, because I was getting like the, leading up to each guest, I like to watch yeah. more and more. And it was just <laughs> saying like, you know, the, the man who would go and kill his daughter because he was dishonored by her doing something. And it's just yeah. like, what the fuck? I know. Like, how could you have that mindset? No, Th- it's, there's, it's it's an ideology that um, it's just truly fucked. Yeah, like, exactly. It, and it's just based on not viewing women as complete people on their own. Well, yeah, it's the, it's the viewing of, um, of them, yeah, agency, of them as property. Um, I say that to Lauren all the time. All the time, I'm like, can you 
it's it's crazy to believe like a hundred years ago, like essentially your dad would be selling me to you. Yeah. In a way, I like have, that's what I a dowry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that's, that's how my grandpa did. I mean, my grandma just went along with it. Yeah. She was English. She's like, oh, this is a this fun is... little ceremony. Yeah. And it was, it's all, you know, that sort of symbolic, but you know, 50 yeah. years earlier and that's it like standard. It would have actually been real money. Legit, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to, to think. I, I couldn't imagine a life like that. I'd be like, oh, Tender, can I, can I go to the movies? <laughs> that's, that's the, okay. So that's the other thing as well in this docker is like, you know, um, well, this, this got also into like political, um, people who are against the government, which is oh, yeah. a bad situation to yeah, be in. But, um, know. you know, if you're a woman, um, I was just telling Lauren this the other day, you, you can't leave the house if your man, if your husband is home. So you can't leave the house if your husband is home. Oh, right. If he's not at home, you must be working your hardest to make sure <laughs> the home and everything is like up to water so that when he comes home, it's all it's, at ease. Yeah. You must not talk to his friends. Yeah. And if you leave the house when he's not home, you must do so hurriedly. Like don't go speak to neighbors and stuff like that. It's like, holy shit. Yeah. It's, um, it's another world. It, it is completely another world. And, um, I don't think a lot of people appreciate that. No, no. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty, pretty yeah. crazy. But, um, okay. So I want to, I'm just looking at, looking at time. I want to mm. get into some, uh, quicker questions. So, sure. um, going back to your mother. You were saying that your mum brought uh, you up as a single mother, worked as – did you say she was an accountant? She was an accountant, uh, but now she's a mental health nurse. <laughs> the complete oh, really? change. Wow. So Tender's mum also did the yeah. same thing, nursing. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that there's lessons that you've learned from your mum over the years? Anything that's – whether she said it directly or indirectly that you sort of have – took with you and, mm. and used it over the years? Um, yeah, yeah. I'd say even from both my parents, actually. Um, when they were together, they actually started a business okay. uh, in Zimbabwe, um, and it was a very successful business. It was the biggest in the country um, at the time, and it was a flag-making business. Right. And I remember being like seven and they were running it out of the back of their house. You know, they had the screens and the flag making equipment. And I remember I was, I was very close to my parents when I was younger. So I'd go with them everywhere. And yeah, like they'd take me to work. They'd take me to meet clients. And, and I, from that, I learned the concept of hard work. Like they just don't sleep. Stop, yeah. yeah. Always on the hustle. Um, so that's definitely something. And, and from my mother, I learned to have fun. She's a party animal. That's great. <laughs> I uh, noticed that at the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> She's um, she taught me to play hard and work hard. Work hard, play hard. Yeah, that was a big thing for her. She she just really wants me to enjoy life. Yeah, yeah, take in as much as you can. Do you when you think of the word success? Are there any people or? ideas that you have in your mind when it when it comes to success um yeah i think i look at someone like michelle obama like her career is amazing and and then to top that off she she was the president's wife after that like she um the work that she's done in her community is pretty amazing um but yeah i can't i i It'd be intriguing if she runs. Yeah, I know. I want her to. Yeah. She really should. Just give it a go. She sounds, uh, from what I've seen, a very principled person, which is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, do you have any morning rituals? Morning ritual? Nah. No? <laughs> I am um, – I'm a night owl. Oh, okay. So I will work late, but in the morning I will sleep in – and it'll take me ages to get out of bed. Like, unless if I have class or work, I'm just, like, in bed. I can't, I can't get out. <laughs> Are you a, a tea or coffee person? Um, tea, mostly, yeah. What type used of to tea? Be, I used to be a coffee person. Uh, when I was doing my undergrad, I'd be having, like, four or five cups a day. Whoa. 
But, um, yeah, that was the horror of law school. Right. <laughs> um, but now, yeah, tea, definitely um, green tea. Yeah. Love green tea. I'm always trying different ones. Um, and so when I was in Japan, I was just in heaven. It was great. <laughs> do uh, do you – you were men- mentioning before about mindfulness and so forth. Do you meditate at all? Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I do mindful meditation um, once – I do like the longer session once a week. Okay. Um, but I do, I try to every morning just do like a five minute one. I, f- I feel like it really helps me in terms of clearing my mind and, um, getting some focus and getting some perspective. Do you, uh, this longer session, how long does it go for? Mm, maybe like 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. And so you, do you use any apps or do you just? Yeah. Yeah. I use, um, I use Smiling Mind. Um, that's guided meditation. Um, it's really good. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I, I do, um, I do those, what are they called? The, the coloring thing. Coloring thing? Yeah. Never heard of it. Man. Is it like an app and? No, no, no. It's, um, the mandalas. Have you heard of them? No. Yeah, it's a it's part of mindfulness um, practice med- med- meditation, and it's where you have these designs, and what you're supposed to do is you, you color them in, but in doing that, you're you're employing mind um, meditation principles and mindfulness. Okay. Yeah, and that's really calming. Interesting. Yeah. We're gonna have to look that up for sure. Do it. It's it seems like really silly. But think about it. Like as a kid, did you not love coloring? Oh, it was in? amazing. Like it was the best. Actually, my <laughs> my favorite thing was um my. I remember someone got me like a booklet, and it was like different pictures, and yeah. all the pictures had, had like they were color coded, so they oh, tell you yes. the color. I love that because I love like numbers. yeah matching it up <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> exactly, and you'd be surprised how. And so when you think about the meditation principles in that moment you're focused on what you're doing and you're attentive to how you're feeling and just you're very present and so sometimes it's something that we don't get enough of yeah so definitely i'd agree with that yeah if you were to do a ted talk on any topic and it can't be uh all of the stuff that we've we've talked about (laughs) okay like something that you really know really well what do I? What else do I know really well? Um, man, I used to say movies. I used to consider myself a bit of a movie maven when I was a bit younger, but um, I haven't been able to keep up. Yeah, I don't know actually. Um, yeah, I was thinking either film because you mentioned it before. Yeah, or board games. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. Board games, board games all the way. Like my sister and I, um, we started this family tradition where we do uh, an Easter egg hunt. Oh, right. Okay. Um, and so we did it around the house. So we'd have, we'd have like three teams and then each team, um, has a, a treasure map that leads. So it leads them on different paths, but okay. they all have the same destination. Wow. So and, well, where do you think this love for games comes from? I don't even know. Um, yeah, because my parents are not really into them. Um, Do you think it's like it's just exciting and? Yeah, maybe I'm like a secretly competitive person. <laughs> <And> <laughs> That's for my, sure. This is my outlet. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I'd say what? What's what's like the game that we've been playing of late? What's that one with the spoons? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> playing you two guys on that, Jesus. Um. Okay, on film, mm. what what are sort of – what would you say is maybe a film or a documentary that's blown your mind in the last few years? Mm. Blown my mind. Um, oh, my gosh, now I'm getting a mind blank. But I saw um, – actually, quite recently, I saw Happy on Netflix – that was really nice. It rings a bell. Happy, yeah. That what? was, um, yeah, it just basically goes around the world 
looking at how people measure happiness. Ah, uh-huh, yeah. And um and yeah, it's been quite in line with some of the stuff that I've been really trying to get into. Um and it was I'll give you a tidbit like one of the fascinating things that they did was they did a happiness matrix test. Um they just had a whole bunch of things to measure that, but um they gave the same test to middle income person living in the US and a um rickshaw driver in Vietnam. Right. And they scored the same. Really? Yeah. Who who were the happiest people in the world? The happiest people were um it's this place in in um South Pacific Asia. Is it Tibet or somewhere like that? And the country actually they don't measure gross national income. They gross they measure gross national happiness. Really? Yes. Um, I forget the name of the country now. I think it's, is it Bhutan? Could Bhutan, be. Bhutan rings a bell, but. Yeah, it could be. But yeah, they actually, yeah, they don't measure, um, national income. Okay. Measure it by national happiness. And I think that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I want to watch this now. Yeah, do I've it. I've seen it. Do it. <laughs> if you, are there any influential books that you've had in your life saying that you'd gift other people? Sapiens now. Yeah. For <laughs> I'm sure. like recommending it to everyone. For sure. Um, but I've been I've been like a nonfiction reader a lot. Like I'm more of a nonfiction, and um, yeah. So yeah, for now I'll say Sapiens. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's what I'm on onto at the moment. Are there any best purchases that you've had over the last few years that are under two hundred dollars? Oh my god. <laughs> This question, <laughs> I really struggled with it when yeah. I was thinking about it. Because does it have to be functional? Like, no. Just, nah. <laughs> Anything that you want. <laughs> that probably makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to say The Last of Us video game. I loved that video game. Oh, it right. was amazing. So this is the zombies one, right? No, no. Uh, well, yeah, I guess, yeah. Because yeah. it's like a, an infection and then it makes people, yeah. Go crazy. crazy. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a beautifully made game. And, and, um, it's like a movie. Yeah. I'd like love to talk to you more about it, actually, because there's this new wave of video games coming that are more story driven. Yeah. And it's just, I, I, I prefer that. And I think that's sort of the future of gaming. So I think, um, uh, yeah, world building mm-hmm. and, and storyline games are definitely like, what, what do you call them? They're not massively. Ma- MMO something, no, you know, massive, the massive online. multiplayer online. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not, it's not that. No, not that. It's just like a the, the open sto- world. Yeah, the open world, the story, like Zelda, yeah, as an example, or like um, Witcher, yeah, or um, yeah. you know, like uh, uh, um, what is the like? A, what would you call like a gun game? But like your first call- person call- shooters, yeah, first person shooters, like Call of Duty is yeah. another model. But you, can, I can definitely see. A good example, my brother knows a lot about this because he's huge on gaming, but yeah. um, the games that he predominantly plays are those storyline-driven games because yeah. otherwise, you know, th- like the the first-person shooter stuff just gets boring after a while. It, it really does. It's quite repetitive. And I think um, just for me as a, as a female gamer, they appeal to me more. Yeah. Um, just, I mean, sometimes blood and gore is cool too, but <laughs> it's got to be balanced out. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you journal or anything like that? Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. How um, often? Maybe once a week, a couple of times a week. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. is there any like structure that you have, or you just you write to just get stuff out of your head? Nah, no structure. Just to to map thoughts. Um, and just, and I think it, it helps with things like depression or anxiety just to have it. Just to, to yeah. get it out. Yeah. yeah. I, I, def- I journal heaps. Yeah. It's good. Cause like for me, I, um, in, in part of my journaling, what I try to do is also, um, one activity that I was taught is to write like five things that you're grateful for, that sort of thing. And I think it keeps uh, you in yeah. check, um, keeps you, keeps you also um in the present and um because you can easily fall into oh i wish i was doing this i wish i was doing that yeah and so um yeah it just sort of keeps you in check 
Yeah, yeah I've got the same thing. It's like four things I'm grateful for, and mm-hmm. it can't be the same as the previous week, exactly. which is hard. Yeah, it, it is hard. But but it makes you examine the, what's nice, you know, exactly. simple things. Yeah, it is. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> if you could have a billboard anywhere in the world and could say anything, yeah, where would it be and what would it say? Oh, my goodness. I have no idea. Um, maybe I'd probably put it like all across the world, if I could, <laughs> <laughs> um, for um in black and brown communities and have some sort of image telling them that the way that they are is beautiful and i think that's um cuz i think um that's something that a lot of women struggle with yeah. um especially um women of color um if you don't see yourself being represented on tv you feel like you have to change and um and i think it's a message that young girls need to learn Mm. I mean, it's, it's a typical teenage thing to, you know, hate yourself, but, um, <laughs> you know, to, to kind of, you know, wish you were something else. But I feel like with women of color, sometimes it goes beyond that, um, in wanting to be white, basically. Yeah. So. Well, you can see that in, um, I mean, Lauren was watching, um, like K pop type TV series and it's just like, wow, they've just like westernized themselves. It's really weird. Mm. So teaching, yeah, to say, you know, value yourself and who you are. Yeah, that's good. I like that. <laughs> well, look, um, we've, we've done, we've jumped well over an hour and a half. We've absolutely smashed it. But thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. If, um, if people want to find you, what, what are the different avenues of social media and whatnot? Um, sure. Uh, so you can find me on Instagram. Okay. Um, Serious Meerkat. <laughs> <laughs> love it that's yeah. my um that's my gamer name by the way yeah. um, also. <laughs> um and i'm on twitter flick o- underscore o one mm-hmm. and also i have my website in my younger years.com okay in my yeah. younger years.com yeah. i thought so so i'll link that to you if you yeah. like and we'll, we'll link all of that. it for sure yeah well thank you so much it's been a pleasure and, yeah, thank uh, you very much. It's been really good. Yeah. Like just talking to someone about some of these crazy issues. Like you can't break them down in half an hour. No, like, you definitely but, can't. Um, it's it's cool to just scratch the surface and see what you think about the stuff too. Yeah, cool. <laughs> thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for making it this far. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure you leave us a review and head to neural.com slash podcast to learn about our prizes, show notes, and gain priority access as a cognitive insider. Don't forget to like us on Facebook or Twitter. It's just at Neural, N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E. Until next episode, thanks for listening.